everybody. Welcome to the Hallmarkies podcast. And today we have a very, very special interview with you. And it's a bonus episode of the podcast. We're talking about a lifetime movie. We're talking about Would You Kill For Me? The Mary Bailey story, which I actually think I know a lot of the listeners are like, oh, that sounds intense. And it, it, it is. But I think that it has some things that will really appeal to the Hallmark, uh, to a Hallmarkies audience that you might not expect from the typical lifetime thriller. So I'm really excited to talk about it. And uh, we have with us, we have the writer of this film. We have Greg McBride with us. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> and we have the Mary Bailey herself. Uh, the story is about uh, Mary. Thank you so much for coming on and talking with us. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. This is uh, this is an honor and I'm, I'm super excited to, to share this and certainly to be on the same platform with, with Greg. Um, so this is an honor. Thank you for having yeah. me. Yes. I, I have to throw in a quick yay for Mary. I want to point out mm-hmm. the movie is based on a book that Mary wrote. And just to get into it, like when I was approached about this movie, I had all sorts of hesitations, which we can talk about. But my biggest hesitation is they were like, oh, well, we're going to set up a Zoom call for you to meet Mary. And I was like, oh, my gosh, like, not only am I going to tell her story in kind of a not fictionalized, but, you know, a cinematic way. How do you take this terrible, terrible story? But one of hope, as is written about in her book, and how do you, you know, tell it in a cinematic way without offending the person who it happened to? And so I was so nervous about that, but I have to say uh, 10 seconds after meeting Mary, like she could not be the kinder, more uh, encouraging person and just was so even encouraging of me taking a little creative license here and there. Like I just, you know, and again, from something that she wrote, she she has her book, My Mother's Soldiers. So um, I just want to acknowledge the writer in her as well. Yeah. So what inspired you to write the book in the first place, Mary, to, to, to put it to pay, uh, pen and paper? Well, I was inspired. I, I really didn't share my, my story a lot with anyone as I was growing up because it was, it's a very tragic story. Uh, and so as a child, you just want to be accepted. You just want to blend in and, uh, you know, just be a part of, you know, your, your friends. You don't want to, you know, you don't want to tell your story for, you know, there's fear of being judged, fear of being, you know, criticized. And I, I just didn't want that. I'd already been through it. And I just, I wanted to start my life and build a life, you know, almost aside from that. So as I got older though, and, you know, you, you meet, you know, you meet people and your friends and, and people ask you, you know, so, you know, you, you talk about your life, you talk about, you know, your parents and you, you know, all these things and I didn't have the, the typical life to talk about. So I did start sharing my journey. You know, this is what happened. I grew up in foster care. And so I told my story and I shared it with people and they were like, oh my gosh, you're kidding me. I had no idea that, you went through that. So as I shared it and I saw that I inspired people, people were, you know, really able to share their stories with me. So uh, I thought, you know, maybe I ought to sit down and maybe write the book. And I was sort of missing my grandmother at one point. And I thought, how can I see her? I have one picture with my grandmother. And I I thought I could pop these VHS tapes in from the trial. Um, I had received those when I was younger and I can see my grandmother again. And so for me, I wanted that healing. I wanted that. So as I began watching and, and listening to what had taken place in the courtroom, because I wasn't there, I wasn't allowed to be in the room. I thought I need to write. I need to start writing down my emotions and my feelings. So that's how it started. That's and good so to much, hear. I'm sorry. I just yeah, wanted to ahead. say so much of, um, your story became even more three-dimensional, right, Mary? Because you found out things in the trial, even though it was about something that you were part of, that you didn't know about at the time because you were so young. And um, Rachel, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I don't know if we want to share just a little bit about the story or oh, you know, we, what we, makes we Mary such a special person. Yeah, we definitely are going to dive into it. Uh, uh, we'll, I, I debated about, okay, how spoiler do spoilery do we want to be i mean most of this on public record uh but uh but i i think uh yeah we we'll definitely talk about it and i'm glad to hear that that the writing process was therapeutic for you as opposed to you know re-traumatizing that that obviously we wouldn't want right 
Right. It's certainly, you know, there was emotion, obviously, writing it. And like Greg said, and I appreciate that, Greg, I, I did. I was able to you know, learn things that I didn't know. I didn't, I didn't even, I didn't even realize at the time that I had been, um, a, a, you know, arrested for murder, uh, charged with murder. I did not know that until actually the People Magazine uh, interview that came out last year. And, you know, going through that process, you know, I didn't realize some of the things my mother was saying behind the scenes to my grandmother, you know, really, uh, I mean, and, and looking back, I mean, she's trying to you know, protect herself. She's trying to get out of, you know, what has happened and, you know, shifting the blame on 11 year old seemed to be the easy way out. And so learning those things about her, um, it changed. I always loved my mother, but I saw her in a different, in a different light. And I, so that was a process that I had to work through aside from just the actual, uh, you know, the things that had happened mm -hmm. you know, to me as a child. And weirdly, Mary and I shared an instant bond because Rachel, as, as you know, I had a very horrific childhood myself, not at all like what Mary went through, but a very abusive mother. And we, we didn't even reach redemption uh, before she passed, but um, I did my own heart, of course. So that's how we move on. But so Mary and I both had these mothers who were actually tragic figures. You know, one of the great piece for me that I write about in my book is that my mother was doing the best she could and her best was terrible. It was awful, but she didn't know any better. And so that was the other thing. I was so happy that with Lifetime, just this is such the producers, Mary, of course, that we really, I really worked to create 3D characters for everyone. It would be so easy to paint the mother in this movie as just a Disney villain, you know, just an arch villain, but she was desperate. She was terrified. She was, you know, all the things. And so to, to capture that, I think helps us heal as people, right? Because yes, terrible things happen. Yes, people do terrible things, but if there's no path to redemption, if there's no path to healing, then even the people that the tragedies happen to can't hope to heal either, you know? And of course there's faith, which I know is very important to Mary. Um, but again, to be able to see your abuser as a human is a gift to yourself, but it's a hard gift to get to. And, and Mary has done that. Now in the, in the movie, you were the one to pick up your mother from jail when she finishes her, her sentence. Uh, is that true to life? That is absolutely true to life. I did. I, I went um, before the board and when she came up for parole and I went and I, and I begged them, I begged for them to release her. You know, I, I was 21 and, you know, I had not been adopted at this point in my life. I had not had a stable family life. I had lived in different foster homes. Um, so to be able to feel like I could reconnect with my mother and get my, you know, get the life back that I thought we were trying to, to build and to have. Um, I thought this is great. We're going to, it's going to be wonderful. And it was an absolute, it unfortunately turned into a nightmare, but, um, but it is true. Yes. I did pick her up from, from prison. How did you not allow yourself to be bitter? How did you get to that point where you could forgive her? Well, at that point, I had not watched the videotape, so I really did not know what had happened. I got those videotapes oh. when I was 15 uh, from from a lady that just happened to be, uh, was the court reporter, and she just happened to be part of the family that I was living with. And we went to a a Sunday dinner, and this the lady, you know, she came up to me, and she said, you're, you're Mary Bailey. And I said, you know, yes. And she said, well, you, I have all the videos of, of your murder, of your mother's murder trial. And I'm like, Wow. So she gave them to me. I never watched them. I was just, and I'm, I'm thankful I didn't um, at the time because, you know, I was able to, to still be what I felt like my mother needed me to be, uh, you know, I needed to be there for her and I needed to help her, you know, transition from, um, you know, prison to, to normal life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, once you, once you found out, then how was, how did you go through that forgiveness process? How was that? So that, that process, once I, uh, I was 30, I think I was 34, 33 when I, when I watched those videos <clears throat> and, and I was, it, I was shocked. And so at that point I'd already moved away from West Virginia and I was living in North Carolina. So we, I wasn't seeing her a lot. Um, 
but we we would text and you know talk on the phone periodically that was hard for me i didn't want to address it with her um directly it was just easier to just continue not having the relationship talk to her here and there when i could um but when i wrote the book that was that was the action I think process of forgiveness. I wrote the book and she wanted a copy and I sent her the copy of the book. And eight months later, it was about eight months later, she wrote me a letter. And that letter was when it really hit me. And I, I forgave her. I called her immediately and I said, you know, I forgive you and, you know, we can move on. And I'm so glad I did. Uh, it was about 35 years, almost to the day the murder happened when I got the letter. It was dated February 25th of 2021. So um, so when I got that letter, I, you know, I was able to, to really process it and, 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 and give her a call and really talk, talk to her about it. Cause you know, like Greg said, she, you, you know, we don't want to always betray, you know, people as this, this terrible person, but you know, she would like his mother, she was doing the best she probably could at the time, but her best was far from good enough. Right. Ho, ho, ho. We'd like to take a second and thank our sponsor for this episode of the podcast. It's the Hallmarkies Patreon. Do you love Hallmarkies podcasts, especially at Christmas? Do you enjoy the holiday previews, recaps, interviews, and bonus episodes? If the answer is yes, please consider supporting the Hallmarkies Patreon. We need your help to do what we do both during the Christmas season and all year round. But not only do you help a podcast led by strong, independent women by becoming a Patreon, you get to become a part of the Hallmarkies family. Starting at only $2 a month as a patron, you will have access to our Facebook Patreon group where we talk about the movies, shows, and more all year. We also have many monthly patron watch-alongs with guests like Lacey Chabert, Natalie Hall, Paul Campbell, Mary Lou Henner, and more, giving their behind-the-scenes details of their films. As a patron, you also have the chance to provide input into the podcast and even join us at different tiers. So this Christmas season, spread some cheer to the Hallmarkies Patreon and become a member today. You won't regret it. Go to patreon.com slash Hallmarkies to learn more. That's patreon.com slash Hallmarkies. Yeah. So, Greg, uh, the the movie tells the same story from three different perspectives. I don't know if that's in the book, but... What was that like? It is not. Okay. What was that like m- writing that I- and making each perspective from the grandma, from the mom, and then from uh, Mary? Uh, what was that like? And how, uh, it seems like that would be very challenging as a writer to do. It, it was. Um, but when I first read Mary's book, I really thought, because, you know, listen, I, I love to write. I love to do what I do. Um, I write a lot of different genres and I'm very blessed to be able to do so. But I was initially hesitant about this project because I I didn't initially see the light in it. And I really, you know, and by the way, I have a horror movie in production. I love good scares and stuff, but I feel like there need to be slivers in, of light in everything I do. That's, that's my goal. Mm-hmm. And so... I really thought it would be interesting to take, you know, there's an old Japanese movie called Rashomon Mm -hmm. and it tells stories from different points of view in the movie and everybody sees the same story a different way. And so I thought, wow, it would be really fascinating to tell the story this way. And to, I really want to pay um, homage to the grandmother's character as well, because it was clear from the book that Mary had such a special relationship with her um, but that the the grandmother's life must have been so complicated in a situation like this. And in the area where they lived in, where they were so poor, Mary would go days without eating. And so I really wanted to tell the story from three different perspectives and save the big reveal for the last thing. That would be entertaining, right? I never thought Lifetime would go for it. And I have to tell you, they went for it from the beginning. I mean, I sort of ran it by them. I go, here's the version you're not going to want. And luckily, everyone, the producers were all so encouraging this. This really was such a team and group effort and just everyone encouraging everyone. Um, And so and I feel like because of it, we've taken what could have been a run of the mill thriller and escalated it. And I know it sounds weird for the writer to be saying that, but, you know, it, it I, I, I wanted there to be 
I wanted us to have compassion for Mary's mother who does monstrous things, but she was in a terrible situation. I even wanted us to have compassion for the Willard character, mm -hmm. you know, as much as we could. And let's face it in, in, you know, it's the old Homer Simpson line. It's funny because it's true. Well, it's tragic because it's true. It's heartbreaking because it's true. And if, if we're just creating stories that are hyperbole or are just the train wreck of the week, then that gets very uninteresting. But if yeah. we do kind of dive into the character um, and understand the perspectives, you know, and I would like to think that's why we got the actors that we got. I mean, a belief between you and me and anyone listening to the podcast, <laughs> I never thought Melissa Joan Hart would want to play grandmother, you know? Um, she's still incredibly vital and beautiful and all the things. And so again, that's just one more example of, it was sort of a snowball, you know, that just began with Mary taking a horrible story and using it to help other people writing her book. And then, you know, other things started to happen, including, you know, getting somebody like Melissa, who really took the role so seriously and was so dedicated to this. She's an executive producer on the project also. Um, and I'd like to think that you see that in the finished piece as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the word I came up with after watching it was that it was surprisingly tender for wow. yeah. a story like this on Lifetime. You just don't expect that uh, to, to be a tender story of forgiveness in the end. It's a t and it's a terrifying story. Like mm -hmm. what Mary went through blows my mind and you know there were a couple yeah. times during the writing where I would have to email text or call her we're we're good buddies now and I'm so grateful <laughs> for that Bye. but at the time I, I couldn't shorthand it or I, I couldn't you know longhand it or be yeah. tender about it I'm like look I need to know this this and this and you know for the for these purposes of the story and because because while we wanted to make it tender, while we wanted to offer hope, while we wanted to have reverence for what happened, we also wanted to tell the story as it was sure. to to make it thrilling too, right? To make mm -hmm. it scary and and a real um, ride, if you will, that people yeah. will want to stay with through the whole movie. Yeah. And so again, I just my hats off to Mary again for just being she was, and this is hard for an artist to do, but. Um, at a certain point, you have to kind of let it go. And it's sort of like, I always call it sending my kid off to college. You know, when I'm done with the script, I'm like, I'm going to see how this is when I get it back. <laughs> um, when I get the, when the kid comes mm -hmm. home. And um, she was so great about that. Mary was on set too. In fact, here's a little spoiler. Oh, really? If you, if you, and here, here you go for you, Rachel, if you rewatch and look at some of the people in the courtroom scenes, you might see Mary no. Bailey. In fact, there's <laughs> one scene, talk about meta, we have this beautiful actress playing 11 year old Mary. She is sitting in the courtroom and the real life Mary Bailey is sitting behind her. Nice. So there's, there's some fun little Easter eggs in the movie yeah. and reacting too. Mary's quite an actress, I gotta say. Oh, there you go. Reacting to her own murder she trial. Knows. A little candy out of there. I mean, Mary, was that, was that, I know you weren't there in person, but you did see the tapes. Like, was it so weird to see just everything recreated and see people yeah. playing you and your grandmother and your mom? And it, it was incredible. That was the one thing I thought to myself, I said, wow, you know, how many people get, you know, get to sit here and watch their life unfold from different ages you know mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. of course you see you know there's 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 baby mary there's 11 year old so there's these and then watching you know seeing it from my mother's perspective my grandmother watching the interactions it was very emotional for me especially watching the sure. interaction between 11 year old mary and, and the grandmother so mm -hmm. um it, it's, it's it's incredible i mean to it's it's just truly greg did, i yeah. mean you could not have written a better He's amazing. And I, and that's all I, it's just, it's speechless. Nice. I, I talked about him the whole time I was Aww. there. I mean, he was very present, even though he wasn't there in person, but yeah, uh, just an incredible, he just did an incredible job and to watch it unfold was amazing. amazing. Well, we are super fans of Greg McBride here at the podcast. Yes. So yes, we agree. Uh, so did Lifetime come to you uh, or did you did you uh did you submit the book or how did it all happen how did it come to be so you know of course I wrote the book the book mm -hmm. got published was out um people magazine 
reached out okay. um, to me. So we did the People Magazine spread. It was like a four page mm. spread. Um, it was in the um, it was in this one, the People Magazine. Oh, okay. Robin. Uh, and they did a TV special also, which is fascinating. If people want to, yes. you can watch it on Discovery Plus, a oh, couple different okay. places. It, it's one of those sort of behind the scenes thing where they interview like the real police that, that arrested mm. Mary and her mom. Mary didn't know she was arrested at the time, but she was. I did. It's and, a true crime um, kind of thing. It's a true yeah. crime. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And they, inter- and they interview Mary's mom. She was, she was still alive at that time. And you even like in the special, and I'm so glad I got to see it because you could tell she really loved Willard, her husband. She, even at that moment, you could see that she remembered being dazzled by this guy. And she was a very young teen, right? Who, what teen girl, including myself, isn't kind of (laughs) swooning, you know, when you meet somebody that is potentially Mr. Right, especially in a small town, you're being raised very poor. And somebody who other people find attractive is, you know, who's also a narcissist, um, is kind of shining his light on you. And Mm -hmm. so- you know, not to give any excuses to anyone, but but again, we we wanted to show how that happened, and so the People magazine um, article right. and the the TV special are quite fascinating because they they really get in there. And mm-hmm. not to not to cut you off further, Mary, but it's also a little responsible for you coming to some peace with your mom before the end, right? Just because it sort of brought all the elements together. It did. Absolutely. I had not seen my mother in over 20 years. Um, And this was when we reconnected and I saw her for the first time. And um, so in the magazine, you know, they've they've got some pictures where we're, you know, just still photos of us talking. But but yeah, that was the first time. And it really allowed me to to just listen to her story. And you're you're right, right. Looking back and watching how smitten she was over that. It just goes to show, uh, again, the more tender side of 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 what she was dealing with i mean she met this man she fell in love with him and you know there was a lot of abuse and violence and i think you know she she didn't know what to do i mean he's abusing her kids he's abusing her but she's so in love i mean abusing your grandmother abusing Mm -hmm. my grandmother you know and she's like how do i get away i mean this man you know and so but it, it was shocking to see how much she still cared or how she those emotions so greg's right it was very obvious <laughs> people like that can be so manipulative yeah, yeah. uh but, but, at one point he has a baby with her best friend that was wild <clears throat> he that has was a wild. baby with uh he married yeah he married uh, a lady that was in the book and um they they had two children together mm-hmm. at the time yeah um, and so so yeah and then and then they got together you know afterwards uh, he divorced her and then you know my mother and him got you know got together but just yeah just crazy stories but she just there were Rachel believe it or not there was a lot that we did not put in the movie because we're like people just won't believe it and also too we of course wanted to streamline everything but the desperation um I'm not a psychiatrist but I play one on tv uh (laughs) that that Mary's mom had for Willard extended to that, that she basically permitted him to have people on the side and sometimes even, you know, allegedly participated. And so there was just, if you can believe it, there was so much more story we didn't tell. And, you know, it was true that Mary picked her up from prison and there was an initial, you know, ease, which we show in the movie. And it's just such a beautiful moment in the film. I'm so proud of it. Um, but there's definitely the next 20 years so there could be a sequel like her her mother was just a broken person at that time and Mary please tell me if I'm talking out of turn but it you know was again just that desperation that just leads us to these terrible choices you know and you know the the old saying that I keep with me personally but even as I write is there but for the grace of God right like one one wrong move in the wrong direction and so many things can can unravel and so this story is, is a bit about that as well yeah. now mary the the film portrays your foster care experience very positively that it was this good experience is that was that accurate 
Yes, for the for the most part, it was some of the things I wrote about in my book about foster care it was really me wanting to just be a voice for the for the foster children who don't all have a good experience. And mm-hmm. for foster parents who are raising these children, um, for me, <clears throat> it was it was hard sometimes feeling like a second class child. Yeah. In the home. I didn't, I'm not the biological child, but but I live there. And and sometimes it's hard. I'm sure it's hard for parents to 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 try to treat the kids all the same. You got your own children, and then you you bring in these other children, and I'm sure you have empathy for your own children because you're introducing them to all these people. So you have to have that tenderness with your own kids, and so that they understand what's going on. But at the same time, as foster kids, we need to feel love too. We need to feel like we're part of something because I fear growing up and not feeling like you are part of a family, you're going to get involved in relationships like my mother did, where you don't feel like you deserve to be loved. You don't deserve to be loved like, you know, you should be. And I, and, and then I think that starts a cycle of, of uh, abuse and domestic violence and, you know, on and on and on. And you end up in a situation. Now, my mother, of course, wasn't in foster care by any means. Um, but I just, I fear that, that children, you know, in situations like that, go out into the world and, and settle. Mm -hmm. We'd like to take a second and thank our sponsor for this episode of the podcast. It's our friend, Jenny Hell. She has a new book coming out called meet me at Christmas. From the USA Today bestselling author of the book to TV stories, Coming Home for Christmas and Christmas Wishes and Mistletoe Kisses, with over 1 million copies of her book sold, Jenny Hell brings you Meet Me at Christmas. This is a heartwarming holiday read that will have you rushing to your loved ones this Christmas. Traveling researcher Stella Fisher is called home to her family's farmhouse to help her mother through the first Christmas without her father. When Stella arrives, she doesn't expect to find Henry Dutton, the man she left behind. As she could guess after her heartbreaking exit so many years ago, he isn't speaking to her. What she doesn't realize, however, is there's a much bigger reason for his unfriendly reception. She quickly becomes the one person he believes can fix everything, but she isn't sure about that. She thought she'd buried her past, yet the look in his alluring blue eyes brings it all right back to the surface. If you enjoyed the Christmas movies based on Jenny's books and are looking for more feel-good small-town romance, look no further. You can find more about Meet Me at Christmas at it's jennyhell.com at harpethroad.com or use the affiliate link below. Abuse people, abuse people, right? Yeah, Um, I I was a little surprised that your grandma didn't uh, become your caregiver. Was she just not in a so space to my, do it or right well so my grandmother is portrayed a little younger in the movie naturally because um melissa joan hart who did a mm. wonderful job played her and um uh, melissa and i talk back and forth she's like why can't i help you more what you know and so we would talk you know and i said well in essence my grandmother was a lot older she gave birth to my mother i believe when she was 48 so oh, at this okay. point my grandma's well into her 70s she's mm. not healthy 70 i mean she's you know, she's, she's got health issues. Um, and she just, she lived with her own son at the time she moved oh, back okay. and lived with him and, and ultimately went into a nursing home, but she, she just couldn't, mm. couldn't care. That her, makes sense. her grandmother. And again, Mary, tell me if I'm talking out of turn, but, um, was, I think such a compassionate woman. And, and I don't know that Mary would be the person she is without the love that her grandmother's shown on her, but Again, this was a different time in the world, and she was an older woman. She was somewhat dependent every now and then, even though they took advantage of her so often, but of her daughter and son-in-law. She was also a God-fearing, church-going women, woman, um, and so she often, I think, felt like it it wasn't her place to say something, and she certainly suffered and we do show it in the movie. She suffered abuse from Willard too, including physical abuse. I mean she she was such a, I think, strong character for for who she was. And, and that's one of the great tragedies of the film. That's one of the love stories of the film is between Mary and her grandmother. And in fact, I'll just insert here that Mary is these days, she is a nurse. She's happily married. She has beautiful furry children who my furry <laughs> children consider cousins now. Like that's right. you, that's another good reason for this story and movie to be out there because Mary is somebody that we can point to and say, oh my gosh, 
there's somebody who is not only a survivor, but a thriver and so full of love and light and is just an example for, for anyone, even if they didn't go through such terrible early life uh, uh, childhood as Mary did, um, to still that, that we can overcome and we can put good into the world and we can take things that happened in the past and accept them and even accept our responsibility in them and and then move, and give grace to the people who 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 abused us and it's um i mean i just i can't state it enough what a special person she is now mary the the film shows you basically being a parental figure for your brother uh was that how accurate was that and and i guess what is your I don't know what your relationship with your brother, what he would think of this film, uh, how that uh, how that experience has been. Yeah, so that that is accurate. Um, um, I think the movie does depict just me and my brother, <clears throat> but there was three of us. There was so there was oh, okay. my brother. Yeah, there was my brother, and then my sister, and then my youngest brother, um, Jacob, who's in the movie. He was mm-hmm. he was about six months old, but I did. I took care of those. I mean, I was I was eleven, ten, eleven. So I was the older child. So I was the one trying to because my mother usually wasn't available. She was out, you know, partying and doing, you know, what I guess twenty five year olds do that shouldn't be doing with you know uh, four children, but. <clears throat> nonetheless uh yes it's very accurate i took care of i took care of them and and helped them and cook for them and yeah well, yes protected wow. them tried to yeah. keep them from yes. from beatings from time to time yeah because of um because of budgetary restrictions we we were not able to have all the children uh in the movie which you know uh mary was also gracious about and we we really even though i you know wanted the story to be cinematic and a film um, we wanted to have as much accuracy as we could too. And, you know, it's interesting, the two main child actors and, it, you know, we, as Mary mentioned, we have, have her character played at different ages, but the little boy who plays Sammy is also just, oh my gosh, melts your heart. I mean, you've seen the movie, Rachel, like that we, the movie would not work if we did not have the child actors that we have, especially Mary, right. Mm-hmm. To, to have yeah. that kind of weight. And, you know, we had some actors that loved the material but did not want to audition because it was so traumatic. Um, yeah. But we, you know, the woman who plays Mary's mother, Olivia, is just an incredible actor. And of course, you know, with Melissa in the movie, everybody wanted to raise their performance to her level as well. But, but mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's all, it's sort of a Jenga, right? If we didn't have the right actors or talented actors playing these roles, I think it would have all fallen apart. Because mm-hmm. again, the woman playing Mary's mother couldn't play it like a villain, right? She, that wouldn't be interesting. Well, Not I was going to ask hours. you about that. I said that for Veronica, as you named the mom, yeah. that she was very selfish uh and but she is also a victim of the situation so i i was gonna ask you uh, what was that like to write it seems like a very tricky character to write it definitely is and it's it's why we have several drafts of a movie (laughs) or of a script Mm -hmm. um but uh it 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 again i could draw on my own experience right from my my mother who outside people looking in was a monster, but part of my freedom, eventual freedom was learning that she was not well, she was mentally ill. And that wasn't necessarily the case with Mary's mom. But, you know, Mary mentioned a second ago, she was a baby having babies. She was in her teens when she had Mary. And, you know, that's part of what you did in this, in this very poor town where there wasn't a lot of work. And it was at a time where, women weren't necessarily in a culture where women weren't necessarily encouraged to to be on their own and and to to talk back to their husbands even um and so i wanted to find the sympathy for her and we we don't hide from from what she did either right. um but but it, again to present a rounded i don't think that she ever got out of bed in the morning and thought now how what can i do today to make my daughter's life miserable you know and so i think when you approach characters from underneath instead of from above that that helps to create better characters and then of course it helps the director we got to mention the director amazing mm-hmm. oh mm-hmm. so so talented simone 
And, um, but then actors too, right? At a, at a certain point, um, the actors then have to take your dialogue and create the three-dimensional thing. And so I've been very lucky in my movies, you know, to, to have just actors who are incredible. And I, I think, you know, at the end of the day, it, it takes so many people to make a good movie. Of course, it's got to have a good script. You've got to have, in this case, wonderful source material, good actors, good crew, good, you know, hair and makeup, like just all the stuff. And then that, that you would have these scenes that were so gut-wrenching where actors would have to, in one second, you know, like poor Melissa you know, had to lose her hearing twice during the movie because, you know, we're showing scenes from, or we're showing stories from di different points of view. And so to be like cut, okay, check makeup, take it, and then have to go into a scene where a little six-year-old girl is about to be beat and you're going to step in so you get beat instead and just have to escalate that. Like, it really took such a an atmosphere of support and encouragement from everyone to be able to do material like this correctly and for mm -hmm. it not just to be a train wreck that that you know is might be interesting to look at but then you're no better off for mm -hmm. having seen it yeah. and it's boring right just to right. tell a story in a linear fashion oh this happened this happened this happened that that would be a 10 minute movie you know or the people magazine special already did that mm -hmm. um so mm -hmm. it was yeah. again and and I have to say, Lifetime was wonderful, just mm -hmm. so supportive and encouraging. It, it really has been such a beautiful experience. Yeah. Even even that usually, not usually, but sometimes people wouldn't even want the screenwriter and the book writer to be collaborating together. Like they mm. just want to kind of keep it separate. And, you know, Mary and I were encouraged to believe in each other from the beginning. And I, I feel like that shows in the finished product as well. So yeah. the the climactic scene where you're asked to shoot your stepfather, I mean, it is just shocking that two grown women would ask this of like I think eleven. You said eleven of eleven year old girl, and not only do do they ask you to do it, but you they ask you to do it three times because the safety's on and again there's the different things keep happening and I thought that was very effective and it just made you angry it made me angry that I mean I guess I could kind of somehow understand maybe coming up with this idea one time but then to just <laughs> to keep you know I mean and I just kept expecting him to wake up and yeah. um and then he, she would probably be dead then if he had woken up and um yeah. I don't know, structuring it that way. I, is that accurate? Is that actually happened? Did they ask multiple times like that? Oh, absolutely. It oh was, it was three times and it was, it was, I mean, I, just to think about it, even though it's, it's a tragedy, I've you know, overcome and I've moved. But when I sit and really think about that moment, because even though it was 35 years ago, walking down the hallway with that gun in your hand, knowing this man is violent, he threatened to kill us before he passed out like he, he would do it and and just knowing that and having to keep going time after time it was just gut-wrenching heart-wrenching scary I, it just but but I did it and I that's some of the reason why I named my book my mother's soldier because I just kept going back to battle yeah. for and that's what it felt like I was doing like she I felt like in that moment she was so desperate um because that weekend, you know, we're all, when all this happened and, and just, just the violence and then the fighting and the, just all those things. I just, she was so desperate to get out of it. You know, she'd left so many times before, but would always come back, would always come back. And so it was like this time, it just, you, you felt that, that what, it, something needed to happen. And, it, and you I ever just. you used a gun before in your life? No, wow. no. And never since either. I never. Wow don't even own one or, or anything like that. And, um, and it's not really for fear. I think of just, I don't, I don't know if it's because of what happened. I just, just choose not to, I know for protection, many people do, and it's wonderful. Um, but I just, I don't want to ever get myself in a situation where I feel like I ever have to, to use sure. that again. I think it would just yeah. parallel with what happened as a child or something. Yeah. 
I just stay away. That from makes it. total sense. Yeah. How, if I, was, if I had ahead. written Rachel, just real quick, if I had written that it took three times and it hadn't, everyone would have said, Greg, this is too unbelievable. Like yeah. nobody's gonna, you you're know, right. There, there's true. just no way. And yeah. I, that was one of the times where I'd be going back and forth with Mary, you know, by text message, mm-hmm. um, you know, just because we wanted to get that so, so correct. And it's, it is, it's, it's horrifying to watch. It is, it is, I can't even wrap my head around it. And I wrote the movie, you know, yeah. it's, it's just, it's just jaw dropping. And then, then to me, this Mary, right. Yeah. It's just, it's Mary, you're a beautiful person. Well, thank you, you so much. But yeah, it was horrifying to, to write, horrifying to watch and, and horrifying to live, to, to live that moment yeah. of, of that. So it's, you know, it's, it's very <sighs> depicted. I know very, very well. So we'd like to take a second and thank our sponsor for this episode of the podcast. It's the Hallmarkies Merch Store. Are you looking for that perfect gift for the postable, hardy, or Hallmarkie in your life? What about getting that t-shirt or hoodie that will help you stand out at your next holiday party? Now is the time to check out the Hallmarkies Merch Store. Full of festive designs by artists like Jessica Miller, Carrie from Hallmark Comics, and more. You can even have more than just shirts, but totes, cell phone cases, notebooks, mugs, and more. And it isn't just Hallmark. We have designs for Anna Green Gables, Man from Snowy River, The Nanny, and more. Every purchase at the merch store goes to help support the podcast and allows us to make the great content you know and love. There are frequent sales, so go to tpublic.com slash stores slash Hallmarkies or see the link in the description. That's tpublic.com slash stores slash Hallmarkies. Thought that you would be punished less or what? Like, what was their, what were they thinking? Um... I, I, well, so you're saying they, it was really just my, my mother, my, my okay, grandmother okay. wasn't involved at all with this. She was actually in oh, bed okay. when this happened. And so were my brothers and sister. It was just me okay. and my mother. Yeah. She, she had told me she, you know, cause I, again, I was like, mom, please, I do, I can't do this. Please don't make me do this. And she said, Mary, if you don't do it, she said, it, and, and I'll go to prison. If I do it, I'll go to prison. You know, I'm like, you know, but he's so mean to us. And she's like, but you're only 11. If you do it, they won't press charges. You won't go to prison. You're a child. And that was her way of, you know, just just grooming me and convincing me that, you know, if you do it, if you do this for us, we'll be free. We won't have to do, we won't have to live like this anymore. We won't have to be abused anymore. So it was just this big, you know, to do of, you know, our lives is going to be so much better. And when you're being beaten every day, you know, there was things we couldn't depict in the movie, obviously for lifetime, but, you know, he would put my fingers in a rat trap and, you know, attempt to, to, to chop them off. And he would just, be, it was, it, the, the, the abuse was just so terrible. So when you're, I you're got, thinking, I got a lot of notes during the course of the thing where they would say, no, you got to take that out. The abuse that Willard would do. Um, and it was all true. None of it was me, you know, kind of, puffing up the piece and and it was so awful that we just couldn't depict everything in the movie and that's one of the reasons why we wanted to because Mary did have you know some up and down experiences in foster care which is important to talk about I think and she does as part of her speaking um, these days but we wanted to have some moments in the movie just showing where she had moments of of peace and calm but in reality, she, she didn't, and and they were starving, and and again, days without food, and the the life that these children were living, um, you know, and the grandmother just doing everything she could to to hold it together. But that's the beauty too, is the the bond. Again, I mentioned it before that that Mary and her grandmother had when they are separated at the end, and the last they see of each other is in court. It's you know that's heartbreaking too, you know, and you you kind of want to go back and and fix it and be like, oh, I want to write a happier ending here, you know? And mm-hmm. there's the, Rachel, the scene where she's talking to the priest about being adopted or the pastor about oh. being adopted was, did happen. Yes. And Mary was there while they filmed that scene. And she, yes. she texted mm-hmm. me later and said that, you know, she was crying and oh, yeah. part of me was glad because that meant, okay, good. We <laughs> nailed the scene. <laughs> But, um, and that was the scene that that actor, the actress had done to get the role was, was that scene. Um, but it's, it's, that's a tragic scene in itself too. 
Yeah. It was, it was, and it was so emotional. So many things that Greg talked about the scene where I see my mother and grandmother, you know, in, in the court. So I was able to be there on set and because they felt like my presence being there, they asked me to stay, you know, the extra days and finish out, you know, the movie with them. I was only supposed to be there for a couple of days, again, budget restrictions and different things, but they said, you're here, Mary, you have really, the set, people are excited. I was excited. And I just felt like, again, it just upped everyone's game. Everyone was so, you know, just so thrilled to be able to, to share this. And I was thrilled to be able to share it, but yes, the emotion of watching those scenes, I mean, you just, I'm just bawling behind the yeah. scene because it's so real and so raw and to watch your life unfold and to see what that little girl went through. Um, it's amazing. It's an amazing yeah. story. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Well, that is great. I, I I mean, I not great that you went through that, but great that you survived <laughs> and thrived and and uh, that you were able to have this experience in in getting your story told. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. And, and yeah. you know, we all go through different things and it's how we take our our, our experience experiences or our tragedies. It's, it's what we do with those. You know, we can, we can take those tragedies and tuck them away and keep them a secret forever and never tell the world what's going on. And so a lot of people say, you know, how do you feel about getting your story out there? You know, it's, it's about helping people because there's people out here suffering different things. Like Greg said earlier, it's not always exactly what I've went through, but everyone's tragedy is, is their own. And, and, and the healing process still, there, there's a process Yeah, regardless of how how it happened or how your childhood or whatever your story is, yeah. there is hope and there's healing. Well, we all have our wounds and I think a part of life is, is healing, hopefully healing those wounds. And, and uh, so I think that your story uh, will help a lot of people. And uh, so I, I really appreciate that and a uh, great job, Greg, and in, in, in bringing it to fruition. Uh, I, I think uh, I went into it thinking, uh, I'm going to watch this because I love Greg. Uh, but, uh, I mean, I'm normally not that into, th you know, thrillers. It's just not my favorite. Um, but I ended up actually enjoying it and, uh, and being edified by it. That's why I should say edified by it. And uh, well, so, thank you. That's yeah. a compliment from you, Rachel. And we appreciate you having on the Hallmark, having us on the Hallmarkies podcast too, because we're big fans of the podcast, obviously. <laughs> and we have such an appreciation for the, the stuff that you normally talk about and review that again, is bringing light and laughter and love into the world, unless it's on the worst list. But, um, but we only we, did that we, once. I saw that too. <laughs> all I know is I'm on the best list. So that's all I care about. That's all but I care. Um, no, we, we really, we, we, we just appreciate because we really want this movie to be seen by, by even people that normally don't tune into Lifetime regularly, yeah. because we feel like it's a very special story. We were able to tell it like we wanted to. Mary was so gracious about it. And, you know, Melissa Joan Hart and again, the director and the producers mm -hmm. and the people at Lifetime. So we appreciate you, Rachel, bringing some attention to it. We really do. Thank you. Well, we'd like to end on a little bit of a fun note. So we have our, since Christmas, will, when by the time this airs, Christmas movies will begin because this airs, the movie airs on the 28th, Christmas movies start on the 20th. Uh, so by the time this airs, Christmas movies will be in full, full Christmas mode. Um, so I thought it would be fun to ask both you and Mary some Christmas questions to end Alrighty. the, the, to end the episode. All right. First question is what is your favorite holiday drink? You want to go first, Mary? Um, my favorite holiday drink is I make it, I make it. So I, I call, I, it's like a cranberry. So I take cranberry juice, ginger ale, a little, um, vodka mm -hmm. uh mix it up throw some cranberries in it and yeah. serve it with a garnish of an orange so Sounds for my good. yeah so I have, I have my Christmas parties and that's my specialty drink so good <laughs> okay what about you Greg wait I'm coming over Mary that does sound good so um, <laughs> I'd say for me it would be eggnog I'm an eggnog guy I love uh -huh. the nog I nice. always feel guilty after I drink it because <laughs> I drink too much of it but uh, I love it no guilt. No guilt. Okay. No. What is your favorite holiday cookie or treat? I would say my favorite. Um, gosh, I, hmm, there's so many. I like the seven layer bar. You know, oh. that's just me. It's got that yeah. creamy, you know, mm -hmm. and it's there's, there's like seven different flavors in your mouth. <laughs> 
graham cracker, chocolate, coconut, coconut yeah. all the good stuff. So the seven layer bar. Oh, that's good. <laughs> okay. And Greg? If I'm looking at a tray of Christmas cookies, I'm looking for the little peanut butter ones with the Hershey's kiss uh, stuck in the yeah. middle. That's a good one. All right. What is your favorite Christmas song or carol? Um, Walking in the Winter Wonderland is yeah, okay. probably my favorite. So I just, it gets me in the mood. Mm -hmm. it, I you know, I live in North Carolina, so we don't always get the snow. So for me, it puts me in this mindset yeah. that there's a winter, you know, blot, you know, snow is shining and sparkling. So <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I'm going to go with a, a rare one. I love Christmas music, as Rachel knows. <laughs> um, but uh, Christmas is Here by an artist called J.J. Heller. If you love Christmas music, mm. Spotify it, Google it, whatever. It's called <laughs> Christmas is Here. And I'm telling you, you'll have a tear in your ear by the end. Like, it's such a beautiful, beautiful song about the season. Oh, cool. What and is your... Can I just... Oh, I'm sorry. Ahead. Can I just throw in One Little Christmas Tree by Stevie Wonder? Because that one oh, really okay. spoke to me as a child. I probably should yeah. have said that one, but that was one I listened to. No one... I don't know if anybody knows that one. I don't know well, that one. But, oh my goodness, Stevie Wonder, One Little Christmas Tree, and and it's so precious. It makes me, it makes uh -huh. me cry. So, cool. in a good way. Yeah. All right. What is your favorite classic Christmas movie? Um, I would say, um, the Christmas story mm -hmm. is that, yeah, the Christmas, you know, I should Ra know. Ralphie. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Ralphie. Yeah. <laughs> try out. I love yeah. that. I have to That's watch that every one. year. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, does National Lampoon's Christmas mm -hmm. Vacation count as a classic think, at this point? I think it counts. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then that's my answer. Okay. Which do you like better, Scrooge or the Grinch? I'm going to go with the Grinch. Okay. <laughs> yes. Can I say tie? I like them both. <laughs> okay. Fair. All right. Which do you like better, clear lights or colored? I'm a clear lights. Love them. I think they're just classic. Mm -hmm. Um, Either as an adult, I like. I'm sure as a kid, the colors were fun. But as an adult, I'm all I'm all clear. Okay. Yeah. I would say I'm clear lights too, and that gives me an excuse to not take them all down on December 26th. <laughs> right. <laughs> all right. Would you rather be in a snowball fight or build a snowman? Build a snowman because we we built one uh, several years ago in the neighborhood and it was about 13 feet tall and it was just this epic snowman. Wow. And, you know, people are sitting on it. So <laughs> definitely build a snowman. My answer is this. Do you want to build a snowman? <laughs> yes, I really, really do. Yes. Snowman. Okay. Would you consider yourself a good gift wrapper or not? I'm going to, you know, no, 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 I'm not. So I, I usually am one who's grabbing the bags, the really cute bags, yeah. but, you know, I can fluff the stuff out of the top, add like, you know, little flowers and make it cute, but to wrap, no. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I will put you you to shame and Rachel you know this because I've drawn you in secret Santa before yes. I I spent years in retail and so I know how to wrap a gift oh. and if I can come into a party with wrap gifts and make other people envious or jealous my work here is done yeah yeah and that's Succeed. what Christmas is all about it Charlie. Is. It is. I'm gonna have to learn <laughs> all right last question what is or, or do you have an ugly Christmas sweater I do and what's yes. your ugliest Christmas sweater? Uh, mine is, it's it's uh, green, has red sleeves, and it has just a big, uh, Rudolph is on the front oh, with the big okay. pumpkin nose yeah. and then the bells. And so yeah. that's what I wear usually every year. That sounds like a legit one. None of these it's, manufactured ones. It's pretty ones. legit. Yeah. It's pretty legit. It's my, it's my favorite. I have a um, a Christmas cat dress that I've worn. Oh. It's got little cats all over it that are, <laughs> have, you know, ball. but the sweater, it's, it's pretty <laughs> Yeah. Do you have one, Greg? I Yeah, I have a couple different Christmas sweaters. I'd say the one that would count as, you know, the ugly one would be one that does light up with multicolor lights, I might add, not clear lights. So yeah. <laughs> That's it, where the multicolored lights come in. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, do you, have a, do you have an ugly Christmas sweater, Rachel? I do. I have one with a cat. It's pretty epic. I yeah, mean, you know, nice. pretty, cats do uh, it for people at Christmas. Fun. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I have some ugly Christmas sweater um, hats that I like to sometimes wear on the podcast because wow. the, the problem on the podcast is you can't really see, you know, sweater very much. 
Uh, and so I, I, that's why I like to wear hats because then people can see it more. But very cool. Yeah. <laughs> Well, very good. You did it. You answered all the questions and congratulations on the movie and for telling your story, Mary. I really appreciate it. And, uh, and for the incredible person that you are. Well, thank, thank you. you. I appreciate it. And thank you for having me on your show. Very exciting. And, uh, I don't know if, I don't know if you have social media or anything you want to share. I, Greg, do you have that you want to share? Well, I'm at Greg McBride, G-R-E-G-G-M-C-B-R-I-D-E on Instagram. And Mary should share her Instagram because not only is it beautiful and she has some behind the scene pictures, which are fun, but again, her, her fur children are quite cute. Oh, so you might want to follow yeah. them. <laughs> yeah. So what's that Mary, on Instagram? Give your... Yes. And mine is My Mother Soldier. Um, oh, just great. like the name okay. of my book, My Mother Soldier. So you can follow, follow on Instagram. Um okay. Definitely. And, and follow Greg for sure. Cause I mean, mm -hmm. my goodness, he's got the cute fur babies and, too. And, Cause I'm silly. And Greg, what's yeah. the, um, uh, what's your, um, Christmas movie called? The Christmas movie that will be coming out at the end of November is the Christmas ringer on BET oh, plus. Okay. And I hope it'll be on regular BET later into the year, but it's a musical. I'm the executive producer oh and, uh, it is in a word joyful. It's starring yeah. Trinice and it's a musical and it's nice. just Joyful full of, full of joy. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you so much to both of you and uh, let us know if you're listening, what you think of all the things we talked about. We'd love to hear your thoughts, especially after you see the movie, come back and uh, share your thoughts in the comments. We'd love to hear that. And uh, you make sure that you're following us at Homeworkies Pod and Homeworkies Podcast, all of our social media. You can find me at Rachel's Reviews all over social media, iTunes, YouTube, and on Rotten Tomatoes. Check that out. Also, if you are listening on iTunes, please leave your ratings and reviews. That really helps us a lot, especially during this holiday season. And if you are uh, watching on YouTube, please give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. That helps us out a lot with the algorithm. And uh, check out the Patreon group and merch store. And we have some new holiday uh, inspired merch. Uh, so check that out. And thanks so much to both of you. And uh, Merry Christmas to everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Merry Christmas.